I start with a sad story, um, but we will get why we went there. Back in the 1800s, there was a once a 350 pounds wrestler in Europe named Yusuf the Terrible Turk. He was huge, and there was not an ounce of flab on him. In his four years in Europe, he was impossible to beat, holding the undisputed title as champion. Then in 1898, he sailed to America to fight the undefeated US champion in a match, a man they called the Strangler Lewis. The Strangler Lewis weighed in at just a little over 200 pounds. But despite his smaller size, he was the heavyweight wrestling champion in America. He defeated many men much larger than himself. His secret was a simple hold. He got behind his opponent and put his massive arm around their neck and cut off their oxygen supply, hence the name Strangler. So when his opponents passed out, he would pin them down and win the match. However, he met Yusuf, the European champion. He faced a major problem. Yusuf didn't have a neck to hold. Yusuf's body went from his neck to a massive shoulder with very little in between. He was a beast of a man and all muscle. The Strangler Lewis couldn't get his hold, and it wasn't long for Yusuf to flip Lewis on the ground and pinned him down. After winning, the terrible Turk demanded all his 5,000 US dollars, which was a fairly significant amount of money back in 1898, to be paid to him in gold. He wrapped the championship belt around his waist, stuffed his gold into his belt, and boarded the next ship back to Europe. But off halfway across the Atlantic, a storm struck and the ship began to sink. When Yusuf attempted to get into the lifeboat, he fell into the water and disappeared beneath the waves, never to be seen again. All his great wealth was too much even for this mighty man. He sank like an anvil and his great riches destroyed with him. I did a future uh, value calculation on the 5,000 pounds at 7% per annum, and it worked out to 13.8 million today. And if we spoke about gold instead of cash, it would have been like three times that amount, about 40 million today. Let us pray. Most righteous, kind and loving Father, as I speak to your people, please guide my lips, please let it be words to my ear, please let it be a lesson to myself, and when I have touched others, I pray that it may be found deep within the recesses of their heart. In that Christian most holy name we pray, amen. When you saw the topic, the least understood commandment, what commandment came to your mind? Anybody? What commandment came to your mind? The Sabbath. Hmm. Caught you there. That would be too easy. I want to say, share something with us today that may not be as comfortable as that. The reading is taken from Exodus 20 verse 1 to 6. Exodus 20, verse 1 to 6. And God spake all these words, saying, I am the Lord thy God, which have brought thee out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. Thou shalt have no other gods before me, that's the first commandment. Thou shalt not make unto thee any graven image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. 
Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, nor serve them. For I, the Lord, thy God, am a jealous God, visit, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation of them that hate me. Six and last, and showing mercy unto thousands of them that love me and keep my commandments. You should see where I'm going now. Let us, let us think of it as we um, communicate. Idols, you must be mad. That is for pagans. They worship idols in Africa, Asia, and mainly Eastern religions. What is an idol? The dictionary offers this definition, an image used as, as an object of worship. Okay, that sounds like Buddha surrounded by burning candles. On that ground, most of us can claim innocence. We are far beyond that. We don't use images when we worship. But that's not the only definition. The second in the Webster is a person or thing that is intensely loved, honored, or adored. This raises major questions, and this is where I will focus today. Idolatry may be closer than we think. At what point does loving deeply cross the line into idolatrous worship? Is it possible to love another person too much? Is it possible to love your house or your car too much? Is it possible to be obsessed with success? Is it possible to love the praise of others too much? Is it possible to love sexual fulfillment too much? If the proper answer is yes to all or one of these questions, then idolatry can pop up anywhere in life even in places we usually don't associate with religion. Hence, any one of us might be an idolater. If we are, we almost certainly don't recognize it. Are you an idolater? I am sure most of us would emphatically answer no. This is because normally we associate the first commandment with the second and, seen idol and we have seen idolatry as statues of Mary and other symbols used in other religions rather than looking at ourselves. We are also great at criticizing the Catholics for their worship of the Pope, which clearly becomes obvious. They definitely will answer to God for failure to obey the very first commandment. But, are we as guilty? I think a place to begin in answering that question is with the following observation. Anything can become an idol when we love it too much. Colossians 3 and verse 5 warns us against greed, which is idolatry. All of us worship something. What we worship becomes our God. If our God is not the God of the Bible, then we are an idolater, whether we understand it or not. Idol worship happens whenever we substitute anything in place of God as the most important reality in life. You can worship money, power, sex, your job, a political system, or another person or group of people. Most people can become idol worshippers by accident because anything good in itself may become an idol and, and if it assumes a place of ultimate importance in our lives. This is a terrifying thought in itself. Marriage is good 
but it can become an idol. Work is good, but our jobs can become our idol. A higher degree is good, but it can become our idol. Children are a blessing from God, but even they can become our idol. Anything good can become an idol if we love it too much. That is, it takes prior priority over God and obedience to His will. This is why Paul calls overindulgence idolatry. The myth of power. Idols of power can be those created things that gives us a sense of significance and personal worth. When we have them, it gives us a false sense of security. We feel we are able to control others to one degree or another. It may be a job, a career, or an advanced degree. It may be symbol status items such as an extremely expensive car or a beautiful home. Solomon in Proverbs reminded us that it is all vanity and he had it all. He had it all. Note, none of these things are evil in themselves, but we can be blinded by loving them too much. Idols of pleasure. So many things drops into this category. It can be things seemingly harmless as watching television. In many Christian homes, as it has become the center of life. We can't live without some background noise. If you don't believe me, try living without a television for seven days and tell me how it feels. And I can say the same for computers and social networks. It may be sports. Driving from Leicester the other day, I saw this sign which really caught my interest. It says, I believe in Leicester Tigers. I believe in a rugby team. Some people in this country will spend their last pound on a football match and forego eating. They will even kill opposing supporters if the, if the game is lost. If they had this passion for Christ, what a world it would be. 2 Timothy 3 and 4 reminds us that in the last days, men will become lovers of pleasure rather than God. Idols of pleasure are the ones that make us happy for a while. They take away the cares of life and even morality. The notion is, if it makes me feel good, go ahead and do it, even though it may hurt someone in the process. How many times we try to justify our actions by saying, I just want to be happy. Sexual fulfillment in one moment can destroy homes children, spouses, and lives forever. Food can become an idol. That is why gluttony was counted as one of the seven deadly sins. It's not simply overeating or eating like a pig. It's making eating the focal point of our life. You can be as skinny as me and you're still a glutton. When food controls you, you are an idolater, whether you admit it or not. So many addictions fall into this category, and, God, and this is called the God of pleasure. When it comes to idols of the heart, the love of money is the root of all evil. 1 Timothy 6 and verse 10. I strongly believe that God, the God of today's society, is the pursuit of wealth and what, at whatever cost, even if it means neglecting the God of heaven. This is why the straight choice was given to us in scriptures in Matthew 6 and verse 24. You cannot serve God and money. Either you will love one and hate the other or be devoted to one and despise the other. 
When you will give up anything for money, it becomes your God. God and money cannot have first place in your heart. One of them has to go. Ask yourself, what would I do for a million pound now, job or otherwise? I was watching BBC uh, last year and uh, saw that this young man decided to drive his mom and his dad into the river so that he could obtain the insurance money that was on their head. Pathetic. Matters of the heart again. A relationship can easily become an idol. When it becomes the controlling interest of life, you can love a person too much or for the wrong reasons or in the wrong way or motives. Once you say of any human relationship, I cannot live without that person in my life. Or, if you sing the song that says, I can't live if living is without you, then you have crossed a line that should not be crossed. God warns us to destroy our idols or even destroy it for us. Notice the warning in Exodus 5. I am the Lord your God. I am a jealous God. The word jealous is very strong, having the idea of burning passionate love. Elsewhere in the Old Testament, it is used for the love of a husband for his wife. I must confess myself that I was put off by the idea of God being a jealous God. But I now understand that jealousy in the right context is a very healthy emotion. I have every right to be jealous of my wife's affection, and she has every right to be jealous of my undivided attention. Jealousy in marriage can be a very positive emotion because it means I am fully committed to you and I expect you to be fully committed to me. In that sense, I can say, you are not, if you are not jealous of your spouse's affection, there is a problem. True love is jealous. If the love is right, then the jealousy is right. So this is what God is jealous for. Our undivided attention, our exclusive focus on Him, seen from this standpoint, Idolatry is a terrible sin because it is, in reality, it is a form of spiritual prostitution. God loves us too much to let anything or anyone come between us and Him. Amen. Amen. Here's an invention for us to check. If all of these seems theoretical, let me share an inventory to spot those places in life where we are holding on too hard. How would I feel if this was suddenly taken away from me? What if my career suddenly falls apart? What if my spouse or children is suddenly gone? What if my house is gone overnight? What if my sight, hearing or ability to walk goes? What about all the money we have accumulated over the years? Let's say that's gone. What would happen? These are not easy questions to answer, but they point to a crucial fact. God has never promised us any of those things or people. They are all with you today and may be gone tomorrow. Life is fickle than we might know. We talk about job or we talk about sorry, we talk about Job all the time, but when the shoes is on our feet, we forget his story. How oh, oh strange. In nineteen ninety-four when we had a 
big uh, banking um, failure and, and we almost had a similar situation here in this country recently. In 1994, um, the banks went down, a couple of the banks went down in, ja banks went down in Jamaica and uh, people lost loads of money. So, where did that, one of my church sisters that sat in my class had her whole life savings in one of the banks that went down. When the story came to her, she instantly got a stroke. I still took the time out to go study with her, do lessons with her after, you know, when she was trying to be, uh, to get rehabilitation and stuff like that. And let me just put a disclaimer on that. Because words went around in church like wildfire and people really was showing lack of care, saying, oh, you know, how could she be so hung up on her money that, you know, this happens. But let us remember that when the shoes is on your feet, you need God yourself. So we should not judge. We should not judge. Just let me make that clear. The fact is though, where your treasure is, there your heart will be. The fun our funeral um, at former Prime Ministers of Jamaica, politicians, judges, whoever you name it. But the key point for me was that I'm glad, I'm glad that God gave her a chance to get her life back intact. And we must be careful when we judge. The only thing God has promised us is himself. Anything else we get is a bonus. Idolatry may not be full blown at the beginning, but there is a thing called creeping idolatry. This happens when something besides God becomes all important to us. Sometimes we hardly know it's a problem until we have a choice. How would you complete these sentences? Lord, I will give you anything but. Lord, I'll do anything for you but. Lord, I'll change anything in my life for you but. Are there habits you will not give up? Are there places you will not forego? Are there relationships you are not willing to end? Anything you put in those blocks is actually an idol in your life, even though you haven't seen it that way. Let me summarize by saying, idolatry lies in the worshiper, not the thing or person worshiped. Don't blame your car if you are not happy. It is your fault that you trust in your car to give you satisfaction. Don't blame your spouse if you are not happy. It is, not, it is your fault that you look to that person to make you happy. No spouse can make you happy all the time. Don't blame your boss. They are not responsible for your happiness. Don't blame your children. God never meant for you to look to them for your only source of happiness. Joy and complete happiness comes from a living relationship with Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. He alone can satisfy the deepest needs of your life, looking anywhere else for ultimate happiness and freedom is really just a sophisticated form of idolatry. Happiness can be an elusive thing. The more we strive for it, the harder it seems for us to attain. Why should faithfulness to God, as opposed to the pursuit of happiness, be our first priority? Besides, which is more likely to produce happiness and why? 
seeking it or seeking first the kingdom of God. The tragedy of idolatry is that it takes all of you and gives nothing in the end. Look at life. Some of us are born, we grow up, get a job, get married, have children, raise our children, take a, a, a vacation, retire, and then we die. Your children do the same, and their children also. Then what? We are here today and gone tomorrow. Just a blip. Just a blip. We have two choices. We can spend our life chasing idols, but when you die, this dies with you. Also, when they die or vanishes, we go with them. Or we can choose to spend our life doing God's will, and when we die, it's not over. True life has just begun. No more pain, no more sorrow, no more death, no more poverty. The folly of idolatry is that you lose out in this life and you lose out again when he returns. It can be the greatest stupidity of all time. Let me just read Psalm 9, 90, verse 12. And it says, it says to us, So teach us to number our days, that we may apply our, our hearts unto what? What we must apply our hearts unto? Wisdom. I will end where we started. Let us not be deceived when as Seventh-day Adventists we claim to uphold the commandments. We quote Malachi verse, um, chapter 4 and verse 4 with pride. We quote Revelation 14 verse 12. We say, here are the patience of the saints. Here are they that obey his commandments and have the faith of Jesus Christ. We quote Revelation 22 and verse 14 with pride. Because we honor the Sabbath of our Lord and the other commandments are automatic, I dare say the first commandment and most ignored and misunderstood may be our very downfall. If we honor and listen this carefully, I can take any challenge on this one. If we honor the first commandment, we will obey all the others. But if we honor the fourth commandment, we can break the other nine. Let me quote from the Zara of Ages, where Ellen G. White spoke to the rich young ruler who swear he had it covered. All these commandments I have kept from being, and it's page 519, all these commandments I have kept from being a youth. That's what he said. Only one thing though, he lacked, but it is a vital principle, said the inspired pens, the inspired pen of, of Ellen White. He needed the love of God in his soul. This lack unless supplied, would prove fatal to him. If he had made this choice, how different would have been his future? To receive the love of God, his supreme love of self, have to be surrendered. Think about it. Go sell all your possession and give it to the poor. End of quote. I will also read to back up what I've said earlier in terms of how we look at the commandments. Mark 12, verses 31, 30 and 31. Mark 12, 30 and 31. And thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, 
and with all thy might and with all thy strength. This is the first commandment. 31. And the second is life. Namely this, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. Listen this part. There is no other commandment greater than these. As I ponder, it seems to me the hardest step is seeing our idols in the first place. I might think to myself, oh, I am not an idolater. But the Holy Spirit may be saying, Richard, you have that idol that needs to be torn down immediately. May, God, may the Lord give us eyes to see ourselves as we are, creating us, O oh Lord, new love for you and hatred for the idols hidden in our lives. May we be willing to run to the cross and worship the true and living God alone. Second Corinthians 4 and verse 18. Why we look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporal, but the things which are not seen are eternal. I never, I didn't speak at all with Elder Elliston last week, and the sermon, strange enough, ended just like mine. Remember what he said? What he said last week, last Sabbath. Are you prepared to remove idols from your life? And my simple appeal this morning, in your heart, you know what needs to be done for God. You know what your priorities are. 